Welcome to the second event in our Laurier Military History webinar series. My name is Eric Story. I am the Outreach Manager at the Laurier Center for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies, shortened to Laurier Military Center for very obvious purposes. And I'm also a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Wolford Laurier University. Now, I've just been really, really happy and so extremely grateful for the response to this series. Um, our, our first event was with Tim Cook, which was a great success. We had many people show up, um, just as many who have shown up for tonight's event. Um, and it, I think it's a really good indication of the appetite for military history, not only across Canada, but also some people in the United States and even overseas and in Europe. Um, for those who might be there, it's probably very late, but we appreciate it if you are there. Um, and I think also a testament to the great work that we do at the Laurier Military Center in Waterloo, Ontario. Um, and I'd like to thank all of my, my wonderful um, colleagues who have helped put together tonight's event uh, in such a successful way that they always do. Now, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the extensive and layered history of the land in which the Laurier Military Center, as well as our partners for tonight, Wordsworth Books and the Region of Waterloo Museums reside. All three of us are situated on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe and neutral peoples. In 1701, this land fell under the dish with one spoon treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples signed as part of the great peace of Montreal in the same year that marked the end of the Beaver Wars. It represented and continues to represent an eternal agreement to not only share and protect, protect resources, but also solve conflicts peacefully. 80 some years later in 1784, the Haldeman Proclamation was signed between the Haudenosaunee and the British Crown following the American Revolution. And the Haudenosaunee were given a tract of land that extended six miles on either side of the Grand River from just north of Orangeville today to its source at Lake Erie. Today, it remains the home of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee communities as well as many other Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island and acknowledging them and their presence in the past and present along the Haldeman Tract reminds everyone of the responsibilities we all hold as treaty people. And to just briefly bring this land acknowledgement, land acknowledgement back to the webinar series tonight, I would also like to acknowledge that this history of the land in which the Laurier Military Center resides is fundamentally shaped by militaries of many different sizes and shapes, war and conflict. Now, I know many of you are not here to see me ramble on, um, give introductions and announcements. And I do promise that we will get to our speaker tonight. I'm, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for tonight. It's someone who I've actually been um, waiting to hear speak longer than I normally would for a speaker series event because we've had to cancel, we had to cancel originally due to the COVID-19 pandemic and then reschedule him for tonight. Uh, and I was very, very excited and happy that he was, that he agreed and we, will, we were able to bring him into the fall lineup. But before I get to him, I would like to let you know just of a few things that are going on at the Laurier Military Center. Uh, first of all, for those who weren't able to see Tim Cook's talk last month, um, our podcast host, Kyle Falcon, has interviewed Tim and a episode has just been released called Writing Public History. It's a fantastic conversation talking to Tim about how to find ways or how writers and historians can find ways to bridge that gap or to bridge those two seemingly untouchable things of kind of maintaining academic rigor while still being able to appeal to a broader popular audience. So I would really recommend you guys go in and check that um, podcast episode up. You can visit canadianmilitaryhistory.ca and click on the podcast tab. It will be the first episode available to you. The second announcement that I want to bring up is that we at the Canadian Military History Journal are looking for book reviewers. 
So for anyone who is interested in writing a book review for us, again, you can visit our website, canadianmilitaryhistory.ca, and you can see a list of titles available for review. And you can get in contact with our book review editor, Cal Falcon, and he can kind of get things sorted so you can um, put together a book review for us. So I will now bring it along to our speaker tonight, David O'Keefe. David O'Keefe is an award-winning award historian, documentarian, and professor at Marianopolis College in Westmount, Quebec. He served with the Black Watch of Canada and the Canadian Forces in Montreal and has worked as, an, as a signals intelligent research historian for the Directorate of History and Heritage. He has also created and collaborated on more than 15 documentaries for the History Channel and National Geographic and has appeared on CBC, CTV, Global Television and the UK TV network in Great Britain. He wrote and co-produced the groundbreaking documentary Dieppe Uncovered, which made headlines around the world, as well as the documentary Black Watch Snipers. He is the, the writer, co-creator, and host of the History Channel's program War Junk, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And in addition, he is the best-selling author of One Day in August, The Untold Story Behind Canada's Tragedy at Dieppe, a finalist for the John W. Defoe Book Prize, the CAA Leela Common Award for Canadian History and the RBC Taylor Prize. Tonight, he will be digging into the destruction of the Black Watch uh, at the Battle of Normandy in 1944 and following in their footsteps as they entered those beaches in June 1944. So without further ado, I'll, I will leave you alone and turn it over to David O'Keefe. Hey, Dave. Good evening, and thank you very much for that long introduction. <laughs> I, um, I didn't realize I had done so much. It just means I'm getting old. Anyway, uh, on that note, I've got to thank you, Eric, uh, Eric, Matt, Kyle, Kevin, the whole crew at Laurier. Um, it was about 29 years ago, I guess, I guess it was, when I first stepped foot in Laurier to attend one of the first conferences that was organized by Terry, uh, Terry Kopp, and of course with Mike Bechtold. And um, so it's, it's always nice, uh, nice to see that something like that is still enduring and that uh, you know, we are continuing on this tradition even now, even in this environment. And of course, with that said, uh, tonight is kind of strange because usually we're, you know, I'm in, in on a stage in front of somebody or in front of all of you, but tonight I get to invite you into my home. So welcome. I've got the fire roaring in the back. The dog is somewhere on the couch and I've kicked the rest of the family out for a little while. So there we, uh, we have uh, some peace for tonight. Um, so without further ado, I guess uh, we can start. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing the screen with the PowerPoint presentation that I prepared for tonight. I promise it's not going to be so much death by PowerPoint. Um, which I know some of you are used to if you've ever been in my classes or if you spend some time in the army, um, you certainly will know that. But what I want to do is give you a bit of a background on why I ended up writing this book. And that actually started about the same time that I first ended up down at the, um, at the Laurier Center. Um, back around 1991, just as the Gulf War had started, I had joined the Black Watch. And um, when I walked into the Black Watch, I had heard about their history, of course. I had my next door neighbor, uh, Charlie Bradley, was in the Black Watch during the war, um, transferred to a different unit and stormed uh, uh, Juneau Beach on uh, D-Day. But, you know, all I ever heard was Black Watch, Black Watch, Black Watch. So needless to say, I ended up joining it. Um, where I spent two and a half years very quick in and out in uniform and then continued on working for DHH and then coming back and doing a lot of historical work for the, uh, for the regiment. But um, when I started this, it was right around the same time that the Valor and the Horror controversy had just erupted. The Valor and the Horror was the CBC documentary made by the McKenna brothers. And um, although the Hong Kong episode and the Bomber Command episode came in for a tremendous amount of criticism, um, the Normandy one was quite solid, and that has to do a lot with the research that was done by Roman Yaramowitz. And if there are three people tonight that I'd like to dedicate this to, one would be Terry Kopp, one would be Mike Bechtold, and of course, 
Roman, without a doubt. Um, uh, this one's for you. And uh, Roman and I used to butt heads over this, uh, always in a good way for many, many years. And uh, Terry and Mike were instrumental in starting me off as a young undergraduate and a graduate student, giving me great insights and also, you know, whatever treasure trove of material that they had available. And it ignited a career, it ignited my interest, and it took me to where I sit in front of you today. So anyway, keep up the good work at Laurier. But as I mentioned, one of the reasons why I ended up writing this book and, being, and was fascinated about the story was although I heard quite a bit about Canadian history and knew quite a bit about Canadian military history, um, the Battle of Verrier Ridge and the days leading up to it, and particularly the Black Watch experience, was not really that well known, despite the fact that there was some significant work done on it through C.P. Stacy with his historical unit in, uh, in Ottawa after the war. But really, for me, my first introduction was when I used to go to the mess and of course, back in the early 90s, you still had a lot of World War II or a sizable amount of World War II vets left. Um, I don't believe we have, I think there's one or two Black Watch World War II vets alive now, and that's it. Talk about the March of Time. Well, I used to hear them talk all the time. And the interesting part was because of whether it was luck, just good longevity, genes, whatever else, um, a disproportionate amount of the veterans that were left were from the scout and sniper platoon. And of course, many of these guys like to talk. And of course, the men who had served in the rest of the regiment, whether it be the rifle companies or elsewhere, used to say, oh, the bloody scouts, they think they've won the war. Well, part of it had to do with their attitude. Um, and I always wondered why. Uh, they were really, really tight as a group. And even to the point, as I found out later, that you know, 70, 70 years later, when they would call each other around Christmas or on their birthdays, and they would only speak to each other about twice a year. And they would always end up, uh, end off the conversation by saying, I love you. In other words, I love you, Jim. I love you too, Sandy. And I always thought that was remarkable. And I didn't really truly understand it until I started digging into the story. What would make men of that age, from that era, and particularly 70 years later, talk about, you know, say, I love you. They must have gone through something. There had to have been an incredible bonding um, episode in their experience. And sure enough, it was. And so when I started digging, um, I started looking at Verrier Ridge and realized that the reason that they were so tight was because almost every single one of them had survived Verrier. And not just survived the assault, because some of them weren't necessarily making the assault themselves going up the ridge, but they were involved in the fighting. But those seven days in Normandy from the time they first went into battle until the battalion was wiped out. That was really what got me and I started looking into what happened on those days. And I realized that it was incredibly ins um, instructional. Um, not only for military professionals, for leadership, but it's also just an incredible human story of what these men went through uh, in 1944. So that's really what the genesis of all this was about. And I know it's kind of funny to, to you know, sort of focus in on the scouts and the snipers, and I don't just simply focus in on them. They become sort of the vehicle for telling the story, and part of it has to do with their role that they played in the battalion. Uh, the scout sniper uh, platoon was something that was relatively new, not scouts or snipers, but a platoon um, was new to the order of battle in the Canadian and British armies, uh, starting in the spring of 1944, based largely on the experiences with the, um, with the Germans in Italy. They realized how um, uh, crucial snipers and scouts could be to pinning down the enemy, inflicting morale, uh, you know, or, or taking a toll on the enemy's morale, et cetera, et cetera. But also too, there was other types of things that they used to do. They used to call, um, they used to carry out contact patrols, liaison patrols, sometimes fighting patrols, reconnaissance patrols. They were the proverbial flies on the wall. They dealt with company commanders, battalion commanders, platoon commanders. They always seemed to be around when decisions were made or, it literally hit the fan. They were always there. And as a result, not only did, you know, they come through it and most of them survived the war intact, 
Um, but they were still around and they were more than willing to sit down and talk to me about it. And it wasn't just the snipers. I had other officers like George Bush and Warren Trudeau and William, Mc um, um, William McKenzie, who sat down with me. And they were absolutely incredible people. Um, honest, open, open to criticism, open to query. And it made my journey into oral history uh, quite remarkable. And of course, there are strengths and weaknesses uh, with that process as well. But the idea was that if I'm going to tell the story of a battalion of 800 men in the seven day period, I had to be able to wrap it around a vehicle that was going to get us to, you know, from the start to the finish. And so when you do read the book, and I'm hoping you will, um, that's basically where it's centered on, although by no means are they the only ones that are featured in the book. As a matter of fact, I try to get as many stories about the men who were there as humanly possible into the pages of the book. Now, one of the reasons, and I mentioned this, and I'm going to hit this right off the bat, one of the reasons why I examined this was because I want you to take a look and think about this. Let this sit in or let this sink in with you. In just the seven days of combat, and remember, the Black Watch had been out of uh, battle for about four years. They had been waiting and training like most of the 2nd Canadian Division. They were not involved in, a, uh, in an overwhelming capacity at Dieppe. They lost one company, but that was about it. They had been waiting for four years to get into battle. And finally, when they did, they ended up in seven days out of the 821 men that landed at Juno Beach a month after D-Day, 581 of the 821 were either killed, wounded, taken prisoner, or suffering from battle exhaustion, what I've listed here as sick, because that's exactly how they were listed in the returns at that time. That is 71% of the entire battalion knocked off strength in just seven days. That includes all four rifle companies destroyed on July 25th, the last of this seven day period, a commanding officer killed, his replacement killed, all four company commanders and their replacements either killed or wounded and their support company completely decimated. This was something that very few, well, I wouldn't say, I don't want to get into a, a, a into a uh, you know in, into a competition here, but the Black Watch and the Calgary Highlanders who are brigaded together end up taking the highest casualties for any Canadian units in the Second World War, and they only came into combat in Normandy in 1944. It is quite something. Well, the end of that day, as I mentioned before, the end of that week comes with July 25th, which was Operation Spring, which next to Dieppe goes down as one of the worst days in Canadian military history. For the Black Watch, they are absolutely wiped out. 94% casualties taken in a morning. That's one man going down every roughly a minute in a four hour attack. And of course, next to Dieppe, it is by far the most costly day for the Canadian Army. And also, it leads to bitterness, recrimination, controversy. There was, as you will see later, mutiny, massacre, and of course, heroism in uh, along the ridge, although I'm not going to get into great detail on that. So tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a vast story arc. We only have about 35 more minutes to do this, so I have to move quickly. And I'm going to leave a lot for the question, the Q&A uh, session, which I'm sure will be quite, at, uh, quite incredible when this is all done. So what I'm going to do is just give you the broad story arc of what you can expect when you um, crack open the book. All right. So first of all, the Black Watch. Um, the Black Watch, for those of you who may not know, is the most storied regiment in the Canadian Army. And of course, it developed its stellar reputation during the First World War, where it sent many, many men off to battle, roughly about two, almost 5,000 men, if I'm not mistaken, and three battalions over four years went off to battle um, wearing either the uh, lapel pin of the 13th, the 42nd, or the 73rd battalions. At the end of the war, 
they ended up with the most battle honors, the most Victoria crosses, and without a doubt, they came out of the trenches as the stars of the Canadian Army after the Great War. As a matter of fact, I've said this before in other interviews, they are up there with the Montreal Canadiens and the New York Yankees of the Canadian Army when they come out of the trenches. Now, of course, all that adds up to not only an incredible sense of pride, but also an incredible attitude. And they make no mistake about it, the Black Watch had an attitude. Not so much today, things have changed dramatically, without a doubt, they're of course regimental pride, no doubt. But there was an intense Black Watch attitude. And of course, some people have even argued a Black Watch mafia within the uh, interwar period, where a lot of the men from the Black Watch, the officers in particular, were from the upper class of uh, Montreal, the Golden Square Mile, as they used to call it. When Montreal, by the way, was the center of the Canadian universe, unlike Toronto, it is you know that it is today, that controls everything from you know from from media to finance, etc., to banking. It used to be in Montreal, and as a result, the men in the Black Watch, the officers, were drawn from that upper crust of Canadian society. They were the captains of industry, the politicians' kids. Uh, the prime minister's nephew, as a matter of fact, served in, or two nephews, served in the, uh, in the officer corps of the Black Watch as well. So they, um, they produced a tremendous amount of officers who then ended up taking on positions in the interwar Canadian army. And as a result, um, they became um, almost Masonic, if you will, in the way things went on behind the scenes. There was a lot of power. Uh, at least for a while, coming out of World War I and leading up to World War II. But of course, when World War II starts, things do change. We now have the expansion of the Canadian Navy, and we have new, you know, new things like a Royal Canadian Air Force, which we really didn't have much of in World War I, but now we do. And we have a tank corps, and we have the engineers that are expanding, the artillery is expanding, and it's drawing off um, and the kind of manpower that would normally go to the Black Watch. Um, other arms of service are now recruiting these people. And so as a result, the Black Watch are nowhere near as powerful as they were when World War II starts, as they were when World War I ended. Just don't tell them that because they still believed in 1939, 40, 41, and 42 that they were the straw that stirred the drink. But things were changing dramatically without a doubt. Now, the Black Watch is your typical frontline rifle battalion. In other words, four rifle companies with about 100 men each. You have then a support company, which has the scout platoon, the anti-tank platoon, the carry platoon, the mortar platoon, and the pioneer or the engineer platoon. Um, it went into battle under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Cantley or Stuart Cantley, pardon me. He was the third in his family, Stephen being his cousin, to command the regiment. His uh, uncle commanded it in World War I, uh, one of the battalions, the 73rd, and was considered to be the godfather of the regiment. And his uh, cousin, Stephen, actually had the reins of the battalion before he took over in 1943. And so he takes them into battle and Stuart Cantley is considered to be, and I will put this in the nicest terms possible, by one of the gentlemen that I interviewed. Um, when I asked him about Colonel Cantley, he said, well, Colonel Cantley was a prick, but he was the kind of prick you wanted in battle. And that pretty much summed up Stuart Cantley. He was a strict disciplinarian. He was, um, he was uh, graduated number one in his class at RMC. And he was destined, I would argue, for high command. He had left the battalion briefly to take on a staff position, being groomed for either uh, a brigade, eventually, if he could take it, or perhaps even a staff position higher up as a operations or probably an operations more than an intelligence officer, somewhere either at a corps or uh, army level. So he was an up and comer. And of course, he comes from the upper crust in Montreal as well, as does most of his fellow officers, or do, I should say. 
including this gentleman here, who was Captain Ronnie Bennett. Ronnie Bennett was R.B. Bennett, the Prime Minister of Canada's nephew, or former Prime Minister at this time. And of course, the other thing that's fascinating, and please keep your ears open out there for young undergraduates and graduate students, if you are ever interested in pursuing this line of inquiry, my suggestion is you look into Bishop's College School in the Eastern Townships. Um, I went down there to do some research because most of these men in front of you were educated at BCS. Like a vast majority of uh, the movers and shakers of the Canadian Army in the Second World War, something I never knew about. Um, they had Radley Walters, the tank ace, Andy McNaughton, Ken Stewart, who was the chief of the general staff, um, and the list goes on and on. Bob Monsell, who became a division commander. These were all BCS boys. And to be honest with you, if you are an undergraduate or a graduate looking for a thesis in a box, my God, go to BCS. They've got an incredible archive and their military history pound for pound is unlike anything I have ever seen in this country. So please, by all means, uh, you know, follow up on that lead. So as a result, when they go into battle, uh, they go into battle as part of the second Canadian division. Now they are brigaded, as I mentioned before, with the Calgary Highlanders and the Regiment de Maisonneuve in the fifth Canadian infantry brigade. Um, they, the fifth Canadian brigade is under the command of William J. McGill, who, if you know anything about the black watch saga in world war II, you know, he becomes not only their brigade commander, but their arch nemesis. As a matter of fact, um, they're, there has never been, and I can argue, I, I, I can say this straight out, there has never been one good word said about Bill McGill from a Black Watch member, past or present. Um, part of that had to do with the reality of what unfolded in 1944, but a lot of it had to do with that Black Watch attitude. As a matter of fact, I would argue, and to be fair to Brigadier McGill, and he does have his problems and his detract uh, detractors, um, he didn't have a chance when it came to the Black Watch. Um, Brigadier McGill was not infantry. He was a signaler. And so on the pecking order, um, the Black Watch really didn't think much of him when he took over the brigade. Um, his personality did not mesh with theirs or vice versa, and that led to some increased friction. But essentially, he just wasn't cut from the same cloth. They didn't feel he was tactically adept. He couldn't, um, you know, read a map properly according to them. And of course, um, I think the, the real um, problem that does bear out not only in Normandy, but throughout the entire campaign is that McGill was rather insecure. He was reactionary. And they used to see him as not much more than a funnel from orders from high command. And that may not necessarily be a problem with him per se, but with the job of being a brigadier. The, the job or the appointment of a brigadier was much different in World War II than it is now. And certainly McGill didn't help himself. He would, I would argue, if you're looking at it in terms of general, the ranks of the generals, he is almost like an NCO um, where he is given his orders and he is going to make sure that those orders are carried out. And as a matter of fact, he was more of a whip cracker than he was necessarily somebody who would think something out, take command and show the initiative. Um, he was very much looking up over his shoulder all the time, particularly to his division commander. And in particular, this gentleman right here when the, when the Battle of Normandy began, that's Charles Folks. Now, Charles Folks, sadly, um, kind of falls into the same category with McGill. Um, I, nobody really understands or can it truly explain the meteoric rise of Charles Folks, except that perhaps he has perfected the art of the sycophant. In other words, for some reason, he just keeps rising in the, the ranks, moving up from one to another um, and getting you know, not only a division command, but eventually a corps command. And then when the war is over in a rather, I would argue, controversial move, he ends up becoming the chief of the defense staff, the first post-war chief of defense staff, jumping over his um, superiors, particularly Guy Simmons, who is, as you will see, one of the legendary commanders of uh, in the Canadian Army. 
Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier, very quickly, um, four years of training for the Black Watch, they were getting, frankly, stale. They were highly trained, but when you do the same thing essentially over and over for four years, there's only so much battle drill one can do um, before you need to be tested on the field of battle. There is no substitute for experience. You can be as trained, highly trained as possible, but when you go into war, you're still green. And so as a result, when the Black Watch finally, after four years of defensive duties and training in England, get a chance to land in Normandy, one month to a day after D-Day, they end up going into what is called a period of inoculation. So the idea is they're going to land on July 6th, and they probably will not go into battle for about another 10 days or two weeks. In this case, it's late on the evening of the 18th of July before they go into battle. Now, during that period, they're getting acclimatized to the Normandy battlefield. So this means, uh, as a matter of fact, the first time that they end up uh, pitching a tent for the night, it's on the grounds of the Abbey Darden, the the uh, famous abbey where members of the 12th SS, Kurt Meyer's headquarters, uh, murdered Canadian prisoners. And of course, which is kind of a macabre thing, they didn't realize that while they were in the abbey, they were somewhere around 17 or 18 murdered Canadians that were buried in the garden while they were there. Well, during this particular time, they're conducting patrols. They're you know, they're, they're shaking out, if you will, just trying to get, as I mentioned before, acclimatized to the battle. They're enduring sniper fire occasionally, uh, some light shell fire. Uh, they go on patrols. One of them is into this little town called Versailles. And then they suffer their first casualties. Uh, basically, a stray shell comes down and ends up killing three men. And as they are being buried by the Padre, another shell strikes and takes the Padre down. The Padre does survive. Nobody expects them to, but he does. But very quickly, there was, as men will talk about in, uh, or, or men will do in, the, you know, in situations like this, rumors will start to run about you know, how bad luck it is to have the Padre being the first one that you know, goes down under fire. Some of them are considering it to be a bad omen. Most of the officers were, you know, and the NCOs would basically tell the men to knock it off. But this is the kind of scuttlebutt that was starting to go around. Now, of course, all the while this is happening, um, the Normandy campaign has evolved or devolved, depending on how you want to look at it, into a stalemate. As a matter of fact, the map you're looking uh, in front of you, or we have in front of us right now, is actually what the projected bridgehead was supposed to be on D plus 17. So this is about two weeks before the Black Watch arrive. Everything down here in white is where the bridgehead was supposed to be by D plus 17. The reality was the black line. So you, you can see that the bridge into a smaller bridgehead area, which makes things very tough when it comes to uh, getting elbow room in there. As a matter of fact, the 1st Canadian Army um, headquarters is uh, delayed. It is supposed to be in action by this time or roughly around this time, but it is its debut is pushed back simply because there's not enough room in the bridgehead at this time. What is happening though, is there are a lot of coalition pressures. Now, most of you who have done any reading on Normandy probably know of the issues and the struggles between Montgomery, who is the 21st Army Group Commander, who has overall command of everybody on land, and his superior officer, Dwight David Eisenhower, who is the overall invasion commander at Chafe. Um, but if you take a look uh, by the time, or from Monty's perspective, by the time July 6 rolls around, things are not going according to plan, despite whatever he's saying. As a matter of fact, he had get, drawn a very broad 90-day arc, a 90-day schedule for you know, concluding the Battle of Normandy. Eventually, he adhered to that. But of course, um, Monty, being the kind of character he was, um, had as many friends as he did enemies. And of course, in a situation like this, 
Um, there are people who are moving behind the scenes and putting pressure on him, either trying to get him sacked because they're not, they don't necessarily have a lot of faith in his martial ability, or frankly, they just don't like him. And so there are some undercurrents that are happening behind the scenes. Um, Part of it has to do with the stalemate or the near stalemate that the Allies find themselves in at this time. One of the big problems, of course, is nobody wants to hear that word, stalemate, because that brings up the ghosts of the Western Front. And of course, the only way that they engaged or, or um, yeah, engaged that stalemate at that time was to employ strategies of attrition. And of course, attrition becomes perhaps the dirtiest word known out of World War I. As a matter of fact, I, you know, some people have said it's not so much a strategy as an absence of strategy. So as a result now, unfortunately, this is what the Allies find themselves in when they're becoming increasingly hemmed in by the Germans. Now, by July 6th, there is no uh, possibility that the Germans in reality are going to, you know, going to push them back into the sea. But it is very possible that they could drag them down into this stalemate. And then of course, turn public opinion against the forces in the allied forces in the bridgehead. And this is something that starts to ramp up as, um, and turns the command um, atmosphere into a bit of a pressure cooker. So the problem is in Great Britain, there's a lot of pressure to get this war over. There is war weariness, which is set in. And people now, they're in the fifth year of the war. They want it over. What is also uh, exacerbating the issue is the fact that they're dwindling manpower resources. There's cannibalization of certain units going on just to feed British reinforcements into the front lines in Normandy. And it doesn't look like this is going to be solved anytime soon. There's also, as soon as the uh, first boots hit the ground in Normandy, the Germans retaliate by shelling uh, London with V1 rockets. So now you suddenly have another blitz of sorts starting, but this time pilotless rocket bombs are now on their way to London. There's a lot of growing impatience, particularly on June 22nd, when the Russians launch Operation Bagration, which completely destroys German Army Group Center and, over a few weeks. And there are massive advances on the Eastern Front, which frankly are gobbling up headlines right around the world. This doesn't sit well with the Americans because around the same time, Roosevelt has just announced that he will indeed accept the nomination to run for a fourth consecutive term as president of the United States. So with everything that's going on in, world, in a world at war in 1944, you also have an election campaign, which is now starting in the United States. As a result, there are a lot of pressure, and there's a lot of pressure uh, being put on Eisenhower, who then turns around and passes it down to Montgomery to get things going and move quickly. As I mentioned right off the top of this segment, there's also some undercurrents going on. Some of the air barons who had spent some time with uh, Montgomery in the North African desert were not too thrilled when he shortchanged them on the credit, at least from their perspective, for the victory in North Africa. And they never forgot this. And so when Montgomery now starts to bog down, their knives come out. And part and parcel of why, how they're trying to get him sacked is because in the area that I showed you earlier, this area right here, where the green um, slashes are, this is area south of Verrier Ridge, which is south of Caen. This is on the Falaise Plain, which was supposed to be in Canadian hands, or at least in Allied hands, by D plus 17. All right, so June 23rd, it is now July 6th. And this area was supposed to be used to move the second tactical air force from England and over into the bridgehead. Well, they were using this delay and the fact that they had to keep their aircraft flying mostly from England, although they did have some fields in the bridgehead, 
Um, they were using this as leverage against Montgomery, trying to get him sacked. And Montgomery was quite aware of the fact that they were using this lack of success or, or lack of success against him. So that was one thing that they were, moved, they were going after him for. The other character in this who plays a massive role in these seven days is uh, Lieutenant General or Lieutenant General Guy Simmons, the maestro, as I would call him. And that is my, um, my homage to Roman Yeremowitz. Uh, Roman and I used to talk about Simmons. We had different views on him. But one thing we always agreed on was that he tended to see himself as the maestro, as the conductor, and everybody else was playing along. And as a matter of fact, he was, for the most part, considered to be the best Canadian commander, best Canadian Corps commander, uh, according to Montgomery. So you can take it as you wish. Um, he certainly was cut from the same cloth as Montgomery. He was, although Montgomery was not a gunner, he certainly was. But he certainly... Um, uh, styled himself like Montgomery. He wore the beret like Montgomery. He walked like Montgomery. He talked in many cases like Montgomery. He's still born in England, although raised in Canada and went to RMC. He still had his British accent. Um, but really where this becomes uh, important for the story was that he was highly autocratic in his command style. And it did have some success because everything as his chief of staff uh, told me had to be done yesterday. And as a matter of fact, when he ended up briefly taking over First Canadian Army later in the fall, there were some who saw him and his command style as a breath of fresh air. But at the same time, he was also a micromanager. He had experience as a division commander in Italy, and now he was getting a core for the first time. But for the division commanders that were under him, they had a very, very difficult task. Actually, anybody who served under him had a very difficult command structure to deal with. As a matter of fact, he, was, um, he tended more to prefer the kind of commander that would carry out his orders to the end, as opposed to necessarily think things through, uh, take initiative, or God forbid, even challenge him on certain aspects. He was known to relieve commanders very quickly. He had a very quick trigger finger, if for some reason you disagreed with him on something fundamental. Well, the one thing that kind of sums him up, and this is where Roman and I used to agree on, was something he had told his uh, aide de camp, Marsh Stearns. He basically, when it came to command, it was all about his subordinates following the music while he played the variations. Meaning that any type of uh, plan that he comes up with has to be adhered to almost to the letter. In other words, he would strip initiative from his subordinate commanders to a degree that was almost paralytic. In other words, they were more worried about looking over their shoulder to make sure that the boss was pleased than actually assessing things on the ground. And you can see that in even, for instance, when he's dealing with Charles Folks, the second division commander, who he, he doesn't really have a lot of faith in, but he knows he will be obedient. And of course, that was probably one of the best things you could say about Charles Folks was that he was obedient. And then, of course, very quickly is the setup that is creating the command context for the Black Watch in Normandy. Well, the first big action that the Black Watch get involved with comes on the 18th, and it comes down here, July 18th, during what is called Operation Goodwood, and it's Canadian subsidiary operation called Operation Atlantic. So as the British 8th Corps is pushing across south of, uh, or east, southeast of Caen, and trying to take the Verrier Borgibus Ridge, which is the ridge that runs down here, which um, pretty much holds the key to grabbing the Falaise Plain that is south of here. They attack from the east and they move west while the Canadians move south. And the idea is to not only grab Verrier Ridge, uh, very quickly on the 18th, if everything goes according to plan, but to push 
armored elements as far south as Falaise. This is one of the big breakout attempts that Montgomery tries to alleviate the pressure, to alleviate the stalemate starting on the 18th. It does not go according to plan. Sadly, this is what war is all about. Nothing survives first contact. Well, July 18th, Operation Atlantic for the Black Watch, they get the honor of leading the 2nd Canadian Division. Their job is a very, what in theory is supposed to be a very simple assault crossing of the Orne River. There's only supposed to be some German uh, rear guards, nothing more than that, because the Germans are now pulling back and they're moving up Verrier Ridge, which is about seven kilometers to the south. So they're, they're told not to expect heavy resistance. They do not hit heavy resistance, but resistance that does take a toll nonetheless. As a matter of fact, um, the way I argue it in the book, this is nothing more than opening night jitters. And as a result, um, as a result, uh, they end up uh, making some massive mistakes, particularly with a simple timing, and they end up losing a, an entire company. Well, on July 19th, they end up um, taking the little town of Ifs, which is in Normandy, and as they say in the Black Watch, the hackles are high. And then after this, they end up being called in. They're expecting to have basically a day off after these two brief battles, but then Operation Atlantic takes a horrible turn. As a matter of fact, Simmons finds out through Ultra and other forms of intelligence that it appears that the German line on the very air, the western end of the feature, has been ripped open. And now he decides he's going to push the 2nd Canadian Corps up and over, only to find out that no, it wasn't ripped open completely, that actually the Germans are moving into that area and their defense is starting to congeal. As a result, the Essex Scottish and the South Saskatchewan Regiment are hit uh, by the full weight of a German counterattack. Both of them end up buckling, one of them breaks, there's panic. It really looks like the, the entire second division is going to be turned back and maybe pushed back over the Orne. Uh, the Black Watch is called in based on their reputation and told basically get in there and shoot anything that comes your way, friend or foe. And the Black Watch is, you know, they're, they're quite thrilled to go in and lay down the law and be the unit that is going to be called upon to stabilize the line. This is very much in accordance with the traditions and the sense of honor that they have been brought up in. The stories of World War I and how they held the ground at Ypres and how they stood shoulder to shoulder at Vimy in 1917. They were definitely trying to live up to their fathers at this particular time. Well, by the end of this, um, Verrier Ridge is still in German hands. The 2nd Canadian Division has taken an extremely bloody nose. And now the Black Watch settle into four hellish days on a hill, a godforsaken hill that is completely exposed, um, overlooked by the Germans on Verrier Ridge, and it's just south of Comp, known as Hill 61. Some of you who have been to Normandy know that on a little uh, rise called Hill 67, there is a memorial. And many of the Black Watch veterans used to call this Hill 67, even though they were never near Hill 67, they were about a kilometer and a half away. Um, it just has to do with the map that they were looking at um, and, you know, the fact that they were about a kilometer and a half away from the Calgary Highlanders who were on Hill 67. Anyway, the point is that for the next four days, um, for those of you who have seen Band of Brothers and may have seen the, um, may have seen the Bastogne episode, this becomes, in four days, a microcosm of the Bastogne episode for the Black Watch and other units in the 2nd Canadian Division. Um, the difference is, of course, it doesn't come after a long string of fighting. It comes in their debut. So basically, they are sitting on this hill. The only difference, of course, it's not winter. You do have the heat and the rain, etc., that's coming in. But they are sitting exposed for days. No sleep, no hot meals artillery coming down, sniper fire, rockets, 
Um, you're dodging German, you know, Panzer-led probes. And the Brigadier, uh, not McGill, but Brigadier Young from the 6th Brigade, uh, who they're operating under temporarily in all this because of the emergency a couple of days before, has cut off rum. Now, this is not a good thing to do to soldiers at any time, let alone when they're in battle for the first time under heavy artillery fire. Um, unlike today where we have pharmaceuticals that will help us with what we now call PTSD or other types of trauma and shock and to steady your nerves, rum was the only thing they had. And so as a result, cutting off the rum, and one would assume it had to do with young fearing that maybe drunkenness had somehow contributed to the panic the couple of days before, the reality seems to be the reverse. And a lot of the reports from the officers and the men who were there cr highly criticized it. Um, because not only now, I mean, you think about it, it was a drinking culture. Not only are you now exposed to artillery fire for the first time and other types of heavy fire, but now you're also battling with the fact that you have to go dry almost immediately. Well, that plays a role. It's not the central role, but it does play a role in one of the reasons why you see a massive upswing in PTSD cases or battle exhaustion case, cases at this time. No doubt coming into battle for the first time, um, having your meals cut off or at least warm meals, that certainly didn't help as well. And then of course, not having the rum to steady your nerves did not make things easier. But from the um, battlefield questionnaires that a lot of the officers were asked to fill out during the war, you could see that the number one issue when it came to jittery nerves was the inability, believe it or not, to hit back at their enemy. So sitting there on Hill 61, um, you know, completely exposed and not having the ability to get back at your enemy who's dealing out the punishment or doling out the punishment to you, um, seemed to have a remarkable effect when it came or impact when it came to battlefield exhaustion. So that was something that I found interesting when it came to leadership in this particular situation. Now, with all that said and everything going on, the only good news, July 20th, the Germans tried to kill Hitler. And as a result, it appeared that things were starting to crack. As a matter of fact, there was talk that maybe they were about to enter into a new 100 days, just like the last 100 days of World War I, that perhaps this was the beginning of the end or the first sign. Oh, by the way, the other thing, and I want you to take a look at this photo. The other thing that the Canadian soldiers, and particularly the Black Watch, were battling was terrain. Um, Verrier Ridge, which lay ahead of them, was just a very simple, gentle rise. As a matter of fact, if anybody's ever been up there, it's a very simple walk. It's not a big, you know, foreboding kind of escarpment. Not at all. It's just a gentle, beautiful rise. But when you're at the bottom and your enemy's at the top it, and they have long fields of fire, it's extremely deadly. The other thing about this is the wheat. Now, remember that the French had been evacuated from the area by the Germans leading up to this. So the wheat had grown pretty high, uh, higher than normal. So it was at least weight, if not shoulder, uh, waist, if not shoulder high by this time. Now, at first, you probably don't think much of it. But the fact that in England, um, none of the Allied soldiers, as far as I know, had ever taken part in any training in crops like this because of the food shortages in England. They weren't allowed to train in this. So this was the first time that they had to live and fight in grain, which at first you probably don't think much of, but um, command and control becomes very, very difficult. Not to mention at night, the Germans who had been fighting in this kind of terrain for a couple of years on the Eastern Front were masters of infiltration. Um, at one particular point, Colonel Cantley almost lost his life when his headquarters um, was hit by a German patrol that actually snuck through in the wheat and was able to use the wheat as a terrain advantage or a modifier in their case to get in. So it becomes this incredible, bizarre world that they're living in, where men are digging down, digging their slit trenches and having wheat stalks up on each side. And they're basically, they're trying desperately to clear, clear lines of sight so they can fire, 
But at night, it's very difficult to see. And they also have to go out and they have to learn very quickly. They have to learn how to patrol, take out fighting patrols, reconnaissance patrols, et cetera, during this period. Well, the other thing that's happening, of course, and I mentioned to this earlier, uh, mentioned this a bit earlier, was the fact that the entire German defense in Normandy has now shifted. It shifted from west of the Orne to east of the Orne, south of Caen, right into the path of 2nd Canadian Division and 2nd Canadian Corps. As a matter of fact, Verrier Ridge now becomes the massive hinge in the entire German defense in Normandy. Now, this, this is still embryonic, it is still growing, and it is still continuing to consolidate and congeal every single day. But one thing about the Allies is they have pretty good intelligence. Whether this comes from Ultra, which is the fruits of cryptography, or, or a little bit down, excuse me, <clears throat> a little bit down on the food chain through direction finding, traffic analysis, uh, radio fingerprinting, they're able to put together a very good idea of what is happening with the German line. As a matter of fact, you know, when they take a look at the area south of Verrier Ridge, they understand fully what kind of battlefield they are about to engage in or about to, to uh, go into battle upon. So in other words, um, if you've ever been to Normandy or take a look at the map in this particular area, you will know that um, the whole area is kind of dotted with old um, Norman towns that come from the Roman ages. They are all encircled with hedgerows to keep the prevailing winds from blowing in all the time. They have very thick steel um, uh, field stone houses, very thick walled steel uh, uh, houses. And of course, under Verrier Ridge, which was used for mining and farming, there are a whole series of different mine shafts. Now, Unlike what you may have seen in some documentaries in the past, the mine shafts were not uh, connecting the reverse slope with the front slope. So in other words, you couldn't, as far as we know, run from, say, behind Verrier Ridge all the way under the ridge and then pop out somewhere in the valley. But what you could do is you could certainly use the mine shafts to duck into to get out of the way of Allied artillery. By the way, I will have to take a quick little sidebar here to say that what is happening over these four days before the big push-up of Verrier is actually one of the biggest artillery duels that we have seen in Normandy. And as a matter of fact, I think, um, and I, I'm not, I think Dave Patterson is in the audience tonight, General Patterson. And General Patterson was in um, Normandy last year to dedicate, or two years ago, to dedicate a memorial to the gunners who fought there. And again, one of the untold stories of this entire episode in Normandy is the gunner's duel. Two SS Panzer Corps are dealing with, uh, or dueling with an entire army group in this particular area. There are roughly 750 rounds per gun being fired by Canadian regiments on a daily basis. That is even higher than El Alamein in 1942. So as a result, Everybody who is dug in, including the Black Watch and the rest of the 2nd Division, are, of course, exposed to this massive weight of artillery shells going back and forth. So basically, by July 25th, this is where the 2nd Canadian Corps finds itself. And you can see it's a relatively unenviable position. It's essentially in a bit of a salient on the south side of Caen, Verrier Ridge being here. And what intelligence has revealed over the last few days has been a massive shift in the center of gravity of the German defense coming from the Odin sector around Hill 112 and moving across the Orne River right into the path of the projected advance of 2nd British Army. By the way, small side note, um, the Canadian Army does not come into operation until the 23rd of July, but it's up here when it does. Second Canadian Corps, despite what some histories have told you, are not operating under the First Canadian Army um, th for Operation Spring, which comes up, but Second British Army. Well, you can see what they're up against. This will not be an easy task, particularly at the end of the day when the intelligence assessment says anywhere between 150 to 400 German panzers are on the other side of the ridge 
backed up by about 150 to 400 assault guns, another 150 to 400 anti-tank guns, and backed up by artillery. You are talking about perhaps one of the greatest concentrations of German might in Normandy, period. This is where it was in this tiny sector leading up to the attack on the 25th. Well, Simmons is tasked with attacking Verrier Ridge. Now, of course, a lot of the controversy over the years was, was this a holding attack? Was this a breakout? It was neither. And one of the problems was because it was evolutionary in nature. When they first conceived, or Simmons conceived of Operation Spring, which went in on the 25th, when he first conceived it, of it in the dying moments of Operation Atlantic, he conceived of it as a breakout, to continue the breakout that was unfolding. Then when the bad weather hit, the German defenses stiffened and the German counterattacks came in, he realized that was a little too much to hope for. So as a result, he ended up scaling it back a bit, but the pressure was on. Monty had to do something because the Americans were bound to launch Operation Cobra over on the western part of the Normandy bridgehead. So in this particular case, Montgomery realized the weight of the German defense, obviously, behind Varia Ridge was sizable, to say the least, and it was impossible for him to launch what he would call one of his colossal cracks um, and break through like he had tried at Goodwood. So he decided he was going to shift gears and he was going to engage in a series of attritional battles to draw the German panzers in and destroy them. And that was the key. So it wasn't necessarily a holding attack just to pin them, and it wasn't a breakout, but rather a series of attritional struggle, struggles that needed to engage and bait the German armored uh, reserves into battle. And that's what he wanted out of Varia Ridge. The idea was to capture the ridge, dig in, and then let the Germans take it back from you at the highest cost possible. As a matter of fact, it resembles bite and hold of World War I tactics or bite and hold tactics from World War I. Kind of like, I would argue, and maybe there's better examples from 1918, but in 1917, not so much Vimy, but rather Hill 70, where you grab an enticing piece of ground and let the Germans pay the ultimate price to take it back. Essentially, that's what he's looking at in Operation Spring. But his plan for it is incredibly complex, overcomplicated, over, overly complex. And essentially, it came down to war by timetable, which left little amount of flexibility. As a matter of fact, when, he, when Montgomery had handed this down to, Monk, uh, to General Dempsey, who was the second uh, division commander who then gave it to um, uh, Simmons, um, Dempsey coined it something which I almost fell off my chair laughing when I, um, when I first read it in the archives many years ago. He coined the whole series of attritional uh, battles as tennis over the orn which is a lovely British euphemism for attritional battles. The idea was to hit the Germans on both sides of the Orne River, batting them back and forth and exposing them then to the might of the allied air power, artillery, anti-tank, etc. So in other words, using firepower to destroy or attrit. Well, this is the plan. And the plan, like I said, was highly complex and complicated. First of all, it started at 0330 in the morning with phase one. So in the middle of the night, phase one would call for the second Canadian division and the third Canadian division to cross their start line, which was supposed to be in allied hands, and it never was. And in three areas, they were going to attack and capture Maser Orn with the Calgary Highlanders, Verrier Village with the RHLI, and Tilly Lai Compang with the North Nova Scotia Highlanders. Once that was accomplished, or whether it was accomplished or not, come 5.30, the next phase would roll in. And that's where the Black Watch come in. They are supposed to move along and just skirt past the Calgary Highlander positions and capture a town on the reverse slope of Verrier, because this is where Verrier is here, right in this area called fontenay le marmion At the same time, the Royal Regiment from uh, Toronto is going to capture Roconcourt. And this is absolute key, the absolute key to the entire operation. 
because once the ridge is captured and you are firmly on the reverse slope and have captured the two towns, these two towns become the strong shoulders in a breach of the German lines. What this then allows Simmons to do is push two British armored divisions. First, the 7th Armored Division, followed by the Guards Armored Division, who are making their combat debut. And they are going to squeeze in between in this breach created by the Black Watch or being held open by the Black Watch and the Royal Regiment. And they are going to turn the flank of Hitler's beloved 1st SS Panzer Division. They are going to turn the flank and imperil it. And they're going to force it to either withdraw or, better yet, by imperiling it, it'll stay in its position. It'll fight in kind of what the Germans would call a hedgehog position. And it would provoke a massive German reaction and counterattack, which is exactly what they were counting on. Well, things did not go according to Simmons' plan. As a matter of fact, the Germans were sensing that something was coming. They struck first. They ended up launching um, Luftwaffe attacks, believe it or not. The Luftwaffe that was barely seen does show up at night and launches some intruder raids and goes right after um, uh, Canadian command and control and has great success. As a matter of fact, timings are missed. The whole plan starts to go off the rails. But as I mentioned at the bottom, the bear has been poked by first light. So as a result, the Black Watch, of course, are trying desperately to get to their position, but everything is going off the rails in front of them. The poor Calgary Highlanders who have the task of capturing uh, Macer Orn at night end up getting uh, decimated themselves in the middle of the night trying to get up uh, Verrier Ridge. As a result, when the Black Watch arrive into uh, Saint Martin, as they're trying to move through this town to reach the, the ridge, they end up stumbling into what could best be described as a hornet's nest because the Germans have reinforced the Canadian start line in the middle of the night. So it is absolute chaos. And in this fog of war, the commanding officer of the Black Watch, Colonel Cantley, and his battle adjutant, Eric Motzfeld, one is killed, Cantley is killed, Eric Motzfeld is knocked out. And as a result, the fog of war turns into the friction of war, uh, which you can definitely read about in the book, where you end up having the remaining company commanders literally fighting over who is to assume command. And there's order, counter order, disorder applies here, there's a delay. And finally, Major Philip Griffin ends up taking over. And Griffin, as you know, is a rather legendary character who ends up uh, taking the Black Watch up Verrier. Now, by this point, there really isn't a lot of enthusiasm for continuing this operation because instead of going up at first light, now it's broad daylight, the Germans hold the entire ridge, and it means the Black Watch has to advance up a ridge into a horseshoe of fire. Well, basically they are sending messages back up the chain of command saying, look, you know, this is probably not a good idea, but unfortunately all they're being told of is to press on. Speed is essential. And eventually they feel that the honor of the regiment is at stake, and they agree to push up the ridge at all costs if necessary. And of course, this is exactly what happens. The Black Watch ends up, and this was their original assault, um, planned assault, but because of everything that was happening, uh, and particularly the uncleared start line, they ended up having to clear St. Martin and then move down to an area around here known as the factory, which was actually the mine head that ran the mine shafts in this area. And then they launched their attack from their original form up point straight up over on a compass bearing over Verrier Ridge towards Fontenay le Marmillon. For those of you who uh, know the story uh, and know what happens next, um, some people have likened it to the Canadian version of the Charge of the Light Brigade. As a matter of fact, the Black Watch are up here, advancing in what they call box formation, two companies up, two companies back. 
Meanwhile, the Germans have a line of sight on them from across the Orne, from on top of the ridge, and they're able to bring down everything from mortar fire to cut them off from the retreat to machine gun fire, artillery fire, rocket fire. And so by the time they reach the ridge, there's only about 60 out of 300 men that made the assault that morning. Only 60 of them are left. And they end up going into um, what I call the witch's cauldron, their Hexenkessel, which is a nod to Cornelius Ryan in my book. And they are decimated um, on the reverse slope, right in the clutches of a couple of SS uh, battle groups and the 272nd Infantry Division, which is fought on the Eastern Front. Um, of the 300 men that make the assault, uh, 320 actually, sorry, that made the assault. Only 20 are fit for duty the next day. The rest, the four rifle companies of the Black Watch, have simply disappeared. And nobody really knows where they are. Well, usually that's where the story of the Black Watch on Verrier concludes. But when you delve into the book, you will see that there is another chapter, and that is the German counterattack, which follows. And a lot of people don't know this, but basically the Black Watch are reduced to roughly about 40 odds and sods, as their impromptu commanding officer, Ronnie Bennett, would call them. Ronnie Bennett being the prime minister, former prime minister's nephew. Well, he ends up taking what's left of the Black Watch and hunkering down in St. Martin in this area right here, which is blown up here, in three farmhouses. And they end up making what is sizing up to be a bit of an Alamo last stand. And well, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to uh, actually ruin it any further. I want you to read the book and I want you to enjoy it. I've written it in a narrative form um, because basically I want you to get a sense uh, and get a feeling of what it was like to be in the shoes of any man in the Black Watch for those seven days. Now, before we go, um, and this will just be the last comment before I turn this back over to Eric and for questions, um, these are some of the pictures that I found during my research. These came from a book, an amazing book on the 272nd Infantry Division written in French by Didier Lodieu. And um, these were photos that he found that were taken by members of the 272nd Division. And here they are with members of the Black Watch who were captured after the assault. Now, the fascinating part is this gentleman here, and this is a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a trivia question or this, or a bit of a trivia note, is what you see hanging here on his chest is the experimental body armor that the Black Watch had been issued with three hours before their assault on Verrier. Traditionally, you wear it under your battle dress and it protects the lower abdomen and the lower chest and your kidneys. But because they got it literally at the 11th hour, they ended up just slinging it over. But these photos are extremely rare. I have never seen them before. And yes, without a doubt, they are in the book. But just to give you an example, very quickly, uh, as I finish off here, um, take a look at the casualties in front of you. These are just the officers of the Black Watch who fought through those seven days. Only a few of them are left when the battalion is rebuilt on the 26th and 27th of July. So let that sink in. And again, that's part and parcel of one of the reasons that I decided I would write the book is because we are talking about a tragedy of proportions that are up there with the Royal Newfoundland Regiment on, you know, July 1st, 1916 at the Somme and anything that any other regiment in the same division uh, ended up experiencing at Dieppe. It is an incredible Canadian tragedy. So Eric, I turn it back to you. Thanks a lot, Dave. Um, I think that's a really sobering way um, to end your, your talk tonight. Um, just how stark and how um, traumatic and deadly um, yeah. it ended up being for the Black Watch. Um, so we're gonna get into the Q&A and I do wanna kind of allow the audience to queue up some, some questions. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll allow you, I'll, I'll encourage you in, in the, uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of the window there, 
Um, you can enter in your questions. Um, but if you also wouldn't mind saying where you are from, I really like to say uh, when I'm introducing the question, not only the individual, but where they're coming from tonight. Um, I'll say two things again as these questions start to filter in. Um, first of all, um, for those who are eager uh, to purchase Dave's new book, um, we've actually arranged with Wordsworth Books here in Waterloo, uh, a local bookstore, um, that for the next 48 hours, both um, hardcover and paperback copies of Seven Days in Hell will be available to you um, at 15% off retail price. So you can visit their website at wordsworthbooks.com and um, search for seven days in hell and you will see that 15% discount. But again, it's only available for the next 48 hours. Now, the, um, the early bird prize um, for tonight, again, it's a signed copy of Dave's book, um, Seven Days in Hell. Um, the very lucky winner tonight is Carmen Patterson. Um, I'm not sure exactly where she is coming from, but um, if she could just reach out to me at any point after the webinar tonight, um, send me her address, um, that would be phenomenal. I will make sure that that copy gets out to you as soon as possible. Now, um, let, let's get into the Q&A, Dave, because I'm sure that our audience, as the questions continue to, to come in at a, at a rapid rate, um, are, are very eager to hear uh, what you have to say. Uh, in response to some of their questions, but I'm going to take um, authority here and I'm going to assert my authority and I'm going to ask the first question uh, of the evening. And that's about kind of Terry Kopp's approach to military history. Um, you've spoken about Terry Kopp before um, and you've read his work. Um, and the thing that he says often about doing military history, and I think this is just his general approach to history, um, is that you can't just look at the textual documents. You actually need to walk the streets oh, yeah. that you are um, studying. You need to explore the battlefields in detail in order to understand that. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, Dave, if you could expand on that and, and whether or not you've incorporated that into your own practice. Have yeah. you walked the battlefields yourself and have you um, use that as a way or a tool to better understand the history of the Second World War in this context? Yeah, I don't think there's anything uh, more powerful and, and better from a historical perspective, at least when it comes to primary sources, as the actual battlefield. Um, you know, this is something that I, you know, my first time in Europe was 30 something years ago, it was 1989 when the wall was coming down. And I remember, you know, I, I, I had read on so many different aspects and I prepared everything when I went. But walking the ground, smelling the air, um, just soaking in what it was that the, the men dealt with or, or could possibly feel at that time, um, all the senses were ignited. And I never read a history book the same way again after walking the ground and seeing the terrain. Also too, for instance, from a practical perspective, I did not understand why Phil Griffin, for instance, made the kind of decisions he did and followed the path he did until you actually get into the town of Saint-Martin, you take a look up at the ridge and you understand that his path for taking the Black Watch up to their form-up point is exploiting all the dead ground because he understands that he's under observation. And so he is now trying to bring the men in by using the dead ground. And you would never understand that unless you actually walked and followed in their footsteps. And that gives you not only a better appreciation, um, but also it solves a bit of a, you know, solves a historical riddle and a mystery for why he ended up doing something like that. So without a doubt, yeah, terrain, fantastic primary source. And I always encourage, you know, people to get over there. Same thing with the work I did on Dieppe. Thanks, Dave. Um, so the next question comes in um, from Stephen Mize from Washington, one of your, one of your friends. Um, and he has, um, he's wondering, um, why is it so clearly important to you to draw out the men that you do in such vivid and profoundly human detail? What is it about that that's so important to you? Um, I think part of it is, as a military historian, you're constantly reading or confronted 
with names. Names on gravestones, names on the men in gate, uh, names in books. But sometimes you need to go a little bit further, at least in my mind, by simply, instead of simply saying, you know, Corporal Bloggins was killed. Well, what can we find out? And in this day and age, with the advances that the National Archives in Ottawa have made on Canadian, um, you know, on Canadian uh, personnel records, it's absolutely amazing. You can get your hands, even, you know, remotely online, even in this environment, you can get your hands on a sizable chunk of personnel files of those who were killed during the war. And so I think it's a lot better, um, personally, I'd like to know just a, a, a snippet a little bit about somebody at, who was killed in battle other than just simply their name. You know, whether it's the book they read, um, you know, where they came from, who their next of kin was. I think it's a way of paying tribute to them. I think it also makes for a much more fascinating and personal read. And, you know, it kind of brings them um, in some ways kind of back to life a little bit. I know it might sound a little corny, but it does... Um, you know, it does reinvigorate something in them. And I think now, you know, the tools that the historian has to do it, um, you know, I think it's something that we definitely need to take advantage of. But at the end of the day, too, I mean, the more you personalize it, the more you develop empathy, you, you, you develop empathy for what they went through and who they were as people. And essentially, as a historian, I think that's the historian's number one task is to develop and, and to, um, you know, to hit empathy and to really develop that in your work. you got to make people feel what it was like to be there in addition to just simply explaining what happened. And I agree with you 100%, Dave. I think one of the kind of most important tools in a historian's toolkit is that ability to really harness empathy um, and really understand the men or the people um, within their particular context and not asserting our own assumptions about history and our present day onto them. Um, yeah. The next, next question comes, we've got two, two um, people coming from the States in a row. Um, the next one comes from Mike Unsworth from Lansing, uh, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And he wonders what the reaction um, to the failure of this operation was from oh. the leadership. Oh, great. Um, great question. This is probably where I have been uncharacteristically, uncharacteristically harsh on a particular commander. I mean, usually I will always endeavor to see all sides and to balance things, and I do. But at the end of the day, I got to follow the evidence. And I am extremely harsh on Simmons when it comes to his decision making. In the immediate aftermath, the war was on and nobody really questioned it. Although the incredible casualties at Verrier Ridge led directly to the reinforcement crisis that plagued the Canadian Army in the fall of 1944, without a doubt. But there really wasn't enough time um, to sort of point fingers right after. But as soon as the war ended, oh boy, did that heat up. Um, when a regiment as politically well-connected as the Black Watch disappears over Verrier Ridge, you know questions are gonna be asked when the time comes. And at the end of the war, the time came. And the Black Watch put a lot of pressure on politically. As a matter of fact, the Canadian Army uh, at that time instructed its official historian, C.P. Stacey, to actually launch an investigation because they knew that there was going to be, you know, some sort of pressure for a statement. And so as a result, he did. But during this, it revealed, um, I would argue, one of the ugly episodes in Canadian military history, which came to Simmons, who was quite aware uh, of what was happening and worried that it was going to derail him for becoming the first chief of the defense staff at the end of the war, which one could argue it probably did. As a matter of fact, his subordinate on the day ended up getting the nod. Fouts became it and he didn't. But um, he ended up putting a lot of pressure on C.P. Stacy, the historian, to massage the facts, to downplay the casualties on the day, what happened to the Black Watch. And of course, Stacy resisted as much as he could. But one of the big problems that Stacy found himself in, although he was a classically trained historian and he used to teach, I believe it was at Yale before the war, um, 
he did not have academic freedom as he would at university. He was a major and then a colonel in the Canadian Army subject to the chain of command. So as a result, anything that his team or he wrote about Verrière ended up on Simmons' desk. And so as a result, the way that he ended up getting around this was although he had to acquiesce to Simmons' demands to massage and to downplay, et cetera, I mean, he couldn't cover it up because it was quite well known, generally speaking, what happened. Um, but Stacy ended up getting, uh, getting out from under it, in my opinion, by noting all of the pressure that Simmons was putting on him and keeping it in a file. And so as a result, you can see when Simmons is trying then, you know, I've met with, you know, the core commander or the former core commander, and he's telling me to do this. I don't agree, but I will have to. And so in other words, he's leaving footprints for future historians to do it. But the one thing that does come out of it, and I would argue that probably in hindsight, Simmons probably regretted this dramatically later on. He, um, he penned his own rationale for the record. Um, even though he didn't want it published, he was going to put it on the record. And in it, he pointed all the fingers at the Black Watch for their own demise. Uh, some of them were justified. There's no doubt about that. But he, of course, completely absolved himself of any responsibility whatsoever in this. He did not talk about the timings, the caveat that was put on about trying to get very ridge before noon or the whole operation would be shut down. He completely sidestepped that. Um, I guess he felt that that would never become known. Um, you know, the message logs would never be released. All the tools that we use as historians wouldn't be released. And that he'd be able to write off in history and basically blaming it on men like Phil Griffin and other members of the Black Watch who were dead and could not answer for themselves. And I think that's where the historian steps in. In other words, you know, we pick up that torch that was dropped on the battlefield. And, um, you know, certainly in the historical realm after the war, um, Simmons attempts to do this. I have called him out and I have said in this book that it is one of the co most cowardly acts that I can think of is trying to throw your subordinates under the bus, particularly ones that cannot answer. Despite the fact that there are some justified criticisms, um, he certainly erases himself from any type of responsibility. So there you go. I hope that's answered your question. And Dave, you're, you're kind of getting into memory, right? The, the mm. making of myth, the making of mm. memory, um, which our speaker actually last month, Tim Cook, went into, yep. uh, well, just published a book on it, The Fight for History. And it just so happens that he's tuning in tonight and he had a question for you, Dave. He's oh, great. Hi, Tim. <laughs> And uh, Tim wonders how, and, and this kind of gets into um, Guy Simmons trying to rewrite history or at yeah. least begin create crafting his own narrative. Um, he wonders how you dealt with the legacy of the battle, not just in terms of Guy Simmons, but others following him trying to write and rewrite yeah. history. Yeah, that's one of the things. I mean, usually when I get into anything that has such a controversial legacy, whether it be Dieppe or, or this, um, my process is to go right back, strip everything out, forget about the secondary sources, go back to the primary sources and work up from there. Um, and so basically the idea is to sort of do a historical timeline and then just see how the story evolves. And then at least I've got the ammunition then to be able to say, okay, what you're, you know, what you're saying isn't necessarily the correct answer here. So in other words, what I was telling you about before about Simmons, um, you know, Simmons claiming at the end that this was just a holding attack, uh, when in reality it wasn't. Uh, this was a battle of attrition and attrition wasn't, it was a dirty word that no one in World War II was going to use. There were other euphemistic terms that they would have used. So in this particular case, it does become very difficult to disentangle this over the years. And also you have to remember too, there's also pushback from the Black Watch. They have their own story and their own version. So you end up with the dialectic where you've got two competing elements, the thesis and the antithesis, and they're going at each other. But to be able to get down to it, the, um, the dialectic only works when you adhere to evidence. 
the weight of evidence. And so what I do is always let the evidence do the talking, regardless of at the end of the day, Tim, whether it's, as you know, good, bad, or ugly. Um, the story has to come out based on the evidence. Um, thanks, Dave. That, that's a, a, a really good answer. And I think a great approach that, you know, young historians should adopt is this, you know, we have not only myth and memory, but also an existing what we call historiography or historical literature that's constantly sitting in the background, buzzing in our ears. And I think that sometimes, especially younger historians and even more experienced historians, they get caught up in that myth, in that memory and in that historiography and they yeah. kind of feed the narrative a little bit too much as opposed to allowing the sources, um, as you know, to really craft the narrative. Yeah, yeah, I think that was something that I learned very, very early in my career. If you can't bring something new to the table, don't bother bringing it. Um, there's no point in just trophy polishing. In other words, you know, taking, uh, you know, taking Vimy Ridge off the shelf once a year and polishing it up and, you know, saying how wonderful we were and then putting it back up. I mean, if there's anybody in the audience tonight who knows that better than anybody else, it's Tim Cook. Um, and, it, you know, the, Tim's landmark book on Vimy does that. It gets away from the concept of trophy polishing. It examines and takes those hard, um, you know, the hard looks and asks those hard questions. And that's exactly what I've done with this, although I do it in a different way, where because I'm writing for a popular audience, I'm basing it on solid historical research analysis, et cetera, academic research analysis, et cetera. But we have to make it accessible. And that's the key. The key is to make things like this accessible. It's something I learned when I was doing Dieppe. I had the first three chapters of my Dieppe book thrown right back into my face by the editor who basically said, look, this is impenetrable academic prose. You cannot write a book for everybody by writing it for the five people who understand Dieppe the way you do. And I'm sure Tim and other historians like Ted Barris who are out there tonight, they understand that. And that is the real chore of the historian right now, is to be able to, to bridge that gap, to be able to make things accessible. Never lowering the bar, ever. But the idea is to keep the bar where it is, but give extra steps to get the audience there. Because for so many years, there was such a schism and a cleavage between popular history and academic history, and never the two shall meet. You don't need that. And part of the way that you do that, actually the big way that you do that, the fundamental step you take is research. Get into the archives. And there's so much, even in this environment, that are still at our fingertips. At the end of the day, truth is stranger than fiction. You can't make stuff up. And that will rely on how deep you go into the archives, how long you take in your research, and how much or, or the size of the corpus of data that you collect. And that's basically, you know, where we go from there. Um, continuing on, Dave, in this kind of... Um almost autopsy of the battle, writing about the battle, myth-making and memory. Um, Pat Varley from Mississauga asks if there was any sort of formal inquiry um, into what went wrong post-battle. Um, hmm. Formal inquiry is interesting. Um, there certainly was a historical inquiry. Um, but again, it was conducted by the army and it was subjected to Simmons massaging. Um, they did interview whoever survived from the Black Watch at the end of the war, but it wasn't an open-ended interview. They basically asked four questions and that was it. And maybe if you had anything to add. Um, so it wasn't a big in-depth investigation where, for instance, if the Canadian government did something like this, you know, today you would have a giant white paper. There wasn't. There were some smaller reports that were written, and there were some as kind of like what you were mentioning are kind of autopsies. So there were studies of firepower and the movements of the Black Watch, etc. But remember that they were done very early in 1945, 46, 47, and maybe again, I think in the 50s or the 60s, but they d didn't have access to the kind of material that we do now. As a matter of fact, for instance, you know, one of the reasons I embarked on this in the first place is because of the release of signals intelligence uh, material, better known as Ultra, 
which allowed me to write my MA thesis on this many, many years ago when I took a look at what did Simmons know and when did he know it? And the only reason I could do that is because ultra secret classifications were now declassified, which is something that, you know, the, these, um, you know, the, the people who would have been doing the investigation back in the forties and the fifties were not privy to even CP Stacy, our incredible military historian, he was not privy to ultra. Um, the British and the American historians were indoctrinated. They understood what ultra was, but not C.P. Stacy. So I've always argued, and I think probably Tim Cook would agree, that Stacy was fighting a you know a historical battle with one hand tied behind his back, and you know, you know, he did such an incredible job with the sources he had at the time. But all historians are limited by the sources that they have at their disposal. Dave, we got a, a question from one of your students, um, Rosanna. Best uh, is tomorrow. <laughs> um, she has a question about uh, air support or the lack ah, of yes. air support. Um, so she just asked very simply, um, why did they not receive any air support during? Okay. Yeah. The, thanks. The, the question of support has always been a controversial one. Uh, from the research I could see, they did get their artillery support, although it did not come down the traditional way. It went on to the reverse slope. So a lot of the men who were making the advance up thought it just never materialized. Also too, the kind of, you know, uh, pasting they were taking would give you the impression that your artillery didn't arrive. Uh, the tank support was indeed late. The tanks were supposed to advance with the Black Watch. They failed to show up. The Black Watch went up anyway. And when it came to air support, air support is a very difficult and tricky question, which Alex Fitzgerald Black and Mike Bechtold know much better than I do. Um, certainly on this, they were not relying necessarily on tactical air power in the traditional sense. Um, the only air power that was really laid on for support in Operation Spring went to the other end of the ridge and it took the shape of about, I think I'm not mistaken, 60 medium bombers who were dropping timed bombs on the first SS positions. Um, there were tactical uh, fighters or uh, tactical fighter bombers around. But for whatever reason, certainly, you know, they were not controlled at the battalion level, they were controlled at the brigade level. And this becomes another issue in the whole Black Watch saga is where is brigade in all of this? Where is McGill? Uh, there's a complete command dysfunction. And some people, and I've argued that, you know, Phil Griffin on the day is not just acting as the acting Black Watch CEO, but he's doing the job of the brigadier as best as he can within his limited means. You know, he's coordinating the artillery, he's coordinating the tanks, he's teeing everything up. Um, the only thing he doesn't have in his hands are the tactical air tentacles because they just don't exist at that level. So unfortunately, there is no tactical air support. Um, great hypothetical question is whether, even if they had it, would that have helped them? I would tend to say it wouldn't. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> um, Dave, I actually got a really great question here. Um, it, I don't know uh, where this individual is coming from, but his name is John Sargent. And his question is, how did the Canadian press cover this event, cover Operation Spring? That is a great question. Um, yeah, the, the Canadian press, um, they did the best that they could um, by trying to... Uh, paint the massacres, because remember, you're talking about the second deadliest day in the Second World War for the Canadians up to this point. And so they did the best that they could. As a matter of fact, when it came to the Black Watch, they, you know, put on the hero spin very quickly. In other words, the idea that, you know, Phil Griffin was extremely heroic, going up the ridge, his last words were, do not send reinforcements. I mean, this is, you know, very dramatic, you know, up with the traditions of the Charge of the Light Brigade, and that's the way they spun it. Um, sadly, my research, um, and there's others like Mike and Alex who have worked on this as well, and Terry, um, I haven't been able to find anything that ever 
has that's corroborated that. As a matter of fact, I have found something that was uttered by another officer to another officer, which appears to be the origins of this story that Ralph Allen, I believe it was Ralph Allen, wrote up. So Ralph Allen had taken something that he heard, put the best spin on it, um, spiced it up a little bit, and then made sure it was good for consumption. Now, despite that, he was also calling it a massacre. He was revealing the fact that the Black Watch had been wiped out. And that was something that raised hackles, not with the Black Watch per se, but with Army High Command. And it was Harry Creer, the Army Commander, who had actually put a stop on that story that was gonna come out on July 28th, three days later. And it was only on August 14th when the story actually broke. And when questioned, Creer said, look, it's you know basically to lessen the sting of the families back home. When in reality, he just didn't believe it. He didn't believe that not just the Black Watch, but all the other regiments in 2nd Canadian uh, Division had taken such a beating. And so it took him a little while to get his head around what had happened to do a preliminary investigation and then realize, look, you know, all the telegrams have gone home now. Um, it, it, you know, it doesn't take much to put two and two together when neighborhoods across Montreal and across Canada are, you know, getting swaths of telegrams. They know something has gone wrong, like Dieppe two years before. So that was the kind of um, approach that the press took. Um, not only the press trying to get a story out, but, you know, dressing it up a little bit, but also the Canadian Army being extremely sensitive to this and delaying the release of that story for uh, over two weeks. Dave, I think what we'll do is we'll do uh, just two more questions. Sure. Um, and then um, what I'm going to do, Dave is very kindly offered um, to anyone who wants to continue this Q&A session in a little bit more of an intimate setting, um, he is offered to continue doing so kind of unofficially once we've wrapped up here on Zoom. Um, you can message him on Facebook. I'll include uh, the link to his Facebook page. Um, and you can send him a request to be a part of that more intimate discussion uh, after we wrap up here. Um, but we'll just, we'll do two more questions and then, um, we'll, we'll end it for tonight. Um, so the first question, it's kind of a, a number of people have asked a somewhat similar question, Dave. Um, so I thought I would kind of package it up, um, all together, um, is how the Black Watch has been memorialized both in France, but also back home. Um, how are these, how are these men remembered both in communities very close to home, but also very far away? Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, a lot of times we talk about much, you know, Black Watch being a Montreal regiment and essentially it is, but when they went into Normandy in 1944, I would say only about 70% were Montreal. Um, there was a sizable contingent of Americans who had actually come up and joined before the United States was in the war. And you had sons from right across from every province in Canada. You had men from Eastern Europe. You had men from the British Isles. So uh, it was memorialized in different ways. But in Montreal, though, um, because the battalion essentially ceased to exist on the 25th of July, um, there was an intense emotional outpouring. And in, I think it was late September of uh, 1944, um, a massive memorial was held at McGill's Molson Stadium. And I think the press reported that there was seating for 7,000 and eight to 10,000 showed up for a candlelight vigil on a Sunday night in September. So you can imagine how intense that was. But, you know, a couple of years later, the Black Watch went back to Normandy and of course, as I mentioned before, kind of the bizarre little things that happened with history, um, that you know the Black Watch was on uh, Hill 61, but they always called it Hill 67, but they were on Hill 61. The same thing when they talk about this battle. They don't talk about the Battle of Saint Martin. They talk about the Battle of Saint Andre, which is really kind of strange because they were never in Saint Andre. The only time they ever went near St. Andre was after the battle. And the reason is because St. Martin and St. Andre are twin towns. And they're kind of kitty corner towns, if you take a look at a map. And it just happens to be that the name of St. Martin has 
uh, or actually I should say the name St. Andre is written over the St. Martin part and vice versa. So at first blush, you think that the St. Martin, which is east of the main road, is actually St. Andre. So for the longest time, they were calling it St. Andre. So I think it was in the 1947, they went back to put up a plaque and essentially they put it up in the wrong town. They put it up in St. Andre, about a kilometer and a half away from where they actually did their fighting in St. Martin. So kind of bizarre memorializations. Now, sadly, over the years with the Black Watch, um, July 25th kind of comes and goes, uh, mostly because uh, for the Black Watch, it's training season, like most Canadian units now, reserve units, you're off in the summer, you're training, nobody is parading. Um, but certainly it always, you know, it's always fresh in the mind come Remembrance Day and, and other, um, you know, other uh, dinners and things like that that we have. So Dave, um, last question for tonight before we um, end this evening and for those who again want to continue along, um, continue this conversation, you can do so um, with Dave afterwards. Um, but the last question, and I think because we're approaching Remembrance Day, um, there were a number of questions from the audience um, about veterans. And I think first of all, just get a sense of how many veterans actually ended up surviving. Um, and then there was another kind of question about um, how these veterans were able to remain cheery and relatively upbeat um, after the battle and also, you know, well after the war uh, for the remainder of their lives. How are they able to kind of keep that disposition relatively high? Oh boy. Now that's, that, that's a very, very difficult question. Um, I mean, part of it had to do with the stoic nature of that generation. Um, also, too, I mean, men were not encouraged to discuss their feelings. I remember my grandfather coming back from World War I, uh, you know, not that I remember him from that time, but I remember the stories where, you know, this is the reason why the Legion, for instance, was so important, because they could get together with other people who understood the context of what they dealt with. And this was their cathartic release. It was their therapy, if you will. But even then, they didn't really talk about it that much. Um, and I know that, you know, as much as we say, and, and I like the way you phrased it, the cheery face, because a lot of times it's all about that stiff upper lip and just putting on a brave face and, and not letting people know that you're in pain. But one thing that I noticed when I uh, interviewed not only the men for this story and for this book many years ago, but for all of that's, eventually when you get to know them a little bit, they open up to you about the type of problems that they have, which are identical to what our vets coming home from Afghanistan now have. They're faced the same demons. Um, you know, one of the guys that I interviewed for this, Gordy Donald, um, as he said, he, you know, I threw myself into a bottle for five years. He said it was, you know, the, the love of a good woman who pulled me out. And I'm sure he wasn't the only one who, you know, took to drink or whatever else to try to steady or deal with the nightmares. Um, Bruce Duckett, who's in the book, I remember him telling me, laying out the pills in front of me, all the different medications now that he was on because of his night terrors, which are still coming back to him or were still coming back to him until the day he died. And of course, I think one of the big problems, and, you know, maybe Tim out there will, will understand this when it comes to memory of World War II, we won. It was the good war. So as a result, you know, sort of the, the Vietnam saga didn't really apply in the sense that, you know, it was, a, it was a good war and, you know, you were fighting for a just cause and therefore everything should be fine with you. Um, this is something that a lot of World War II vets, for instance, experienced and also even the guys who survived the EP or to survive this also dealt with. Um, you know, the fact that somehow all these, you know, uh, horrific experiences, traumatic experiences of war would somehow disappear simply because we won the war. And, you know, maybe that's our position here in Canada. You know, we've, we've always, we've been so fortunate that we've never truly hosted war in what, 200, 300 years? We've never really felt the sting of total war. We've never felt the sting of total war like they have in Europe. And so we have, um, 
a kind of a view of the way we look at um, our, our Canadian uh, experiences or our experiences on the battlefield as kind of being the cavalry coming to the rescue. We are extremely proud and justifiably so of liberating France and Belgium and Italy and, and of course the Netherlands. But that doesn't take away from the nightmares. And so the idea that, you know, somehow just because we were there for the right reasons, we did good and we won, somehow mitigates it. My experience of dealing with hundreds of veterans for now 25 years as a professional historian, almost 30 years as a professional historian, that just doesn't hold weight. These people suffer and they suffer with dignity. They suffer quietly, but they suffer. Dave, I, I don't normally do this, but there was a last minute question. Okay. <laughs> which I thought was just, it was a really, really good question right. um, that um, I, think, I think you could speak to. Um, this one's coming from Noreen Hines. Uh, I'm not sure where she's coming from, but she wonders about the POWs because her husband was, was a PO, POW spending 10 months um, as a POW. Yeah. And so she wonders about what happened to those POWs. Well, some of them, the ones who were wounded, actually, it sounds strange, the ones that are wounded ended up getting off relatively lucky because they ended up in hospital for maybe about two to three weeks because most of the German hospitals were in France at that time. So you were taken off the battlefield and taken to a French hospital. And, um, and as a result, when the Allies ended up advancing and knocking the Germans out of Normandy and out of France, the POWs who were wounded were liberated. And so they were the ones that tended to get off luckier than the others. The others were sent by train, kind of the, the typical story, um, you know, thrown into boxcars and basically taken off to Poland and they were split up and sent to different camps. And then of course, in January of 1945, um, they started the long march, the, the forced march, which only ended up in April. And um, they ended up coming home. So in many cases, the POW story was very similar to any of the other ones, with the exception of the men who were wounded, um, who were just, you know, abandoned by the Germans when the Allies advanced. And uh, a lot of them, the men, some of the men like Gordy Donnell and Bruce Duckett were liberated by the Americans. Um, they're in the book as well. Well, Dave, I want to thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, the visuals were great. The video was excellent. Um, and the talk, of course, was great. I also want to thank you very much for uh, such an extensive Q&A period. There's, we have such an eager crowd here tonight. There was over, <laughs> 50, over 60 questions asked. And so I was kind of very quickly... Wow. And, um, <laughs> trying to get through those questions as best I could, picking out the best ones. But there were so many that I, that I just couldn't ask because we didn't have enough time. So again, for those that didn't get to have their questions answered, um, but would like to have their questions answered or to have a little bit more of a, an extensive conversation with Dave, um, again, I've included it in the chat bar, um, a link to Dave's Facebook account. Um, you can send him a message and he will send you a link on Zoom so that you can continue this conversation uh, into the evening. Um, so on behalf of the uh, Laurier Military Center, um, I would like to thank, of course, Dave for a fantastic um, evening, uh, but I would also like to thank our partners, the Region of Waterloo Museums and Wordsworth Books. Um, again, for those who want to purchase a copy of Seven Days in Hell, please go to wordsworthbooks.com as there is a 15% discount on both the hardcover and paperback copies. Um, other than that, um, I'll say if you really enjoy what we do here at the Laurier Military Center, you enjoy the webinar series tonight, I would highly encourage you to go to our website, canadianmilitaryhistory.ca, scroll down to about halfway down the page, and hit the subscribe button. And from there you will give, you will be provided with updates and news about what we're doing here at the Laurier Military Center, uh, future updates about events like the webinar series, conferences and publications that we do 
um, again at the Laurier Military Center. So please do so. Other than that, Dave, thanks again. Um, thanks to everyone who came out tonight. And we will see you for our next event on Remembrance Day with Dr. Alex Suchin, who will be giving a talk on his new book called War Junk um, about the post-war disposal process uh, of the Canadian state. Again, have a fantastic evening. Thanks again, and we'll, we'll see you very soon. Thanks, everybody.